joy or happiness, success or failure, peace or dismay. The foundations of our life rest on the words we receive. A word of hope and guidance, translated from the Temple of Solomon in Brazil. You are listening to a word of faith with Bishop Macedo. Univer Video is your platform for Christian content, and it gives you access to the church meetings of the Universal Church around the world, and they are in English. Even the meetings at the Temple of Solomon that provide live, simultaneous translations to English. All you have to do is sign up, and this is how: visit www.univervideo.com online, or download the application on your mobile device. And complete the simple registration form. Have your bank card ready, and choose your terms of payment. And before you know it, you'll be up and running. Stay connected to the things of faith during the 21 days fast of Daniel. Hello, my friends. May God bless all of you in the name of Jesus Christ. He blesses with peace, with peace. May the heavenly peace be with all of you. I would like, and speaking of peace, referring to peace, everybody wants peace. Yes or no? Everybody wants peace. But not everyone is willing to pay the price to have peace. Not everyone is willing to pay the price which peace demands. And when we speak of peace, we speak of a divine peace. Peace which comes from above, not peace from this world, because peace from this world is worthless. The peace of this world is worthless. Because if the world, as the Bible says, the world is under the sway of evil, it's under evil. If the world is deep in evil and sin, so how can there be peace to the world which lives in sin? Same things happen to people. They want peace. They want peace. Religious people want peace. They go to church. They go to their religions. They make their vows. They conquer blessings. But there is no peace. There is no peace. Why? Because peace, the price. <laughs> The price which God paid to give us peace was the life of Jesus in Calvary. That's it. It is impossible for a person to have peace if they are living in sin. It's impossible. There is no person who lives in peace who also lives in sin. Peace does not mix with sin. And I am referring to the peace of spirit, peace within the soul, peace in your conscious, peace which comes from above, not that peace in that moment which a person lives, you know, going to parties, having fun, drinking, living, in an unlawful manner. No, I'm referring to peace which one has within them. They carry it as if it's a gem, a precious gem. They carry it with them, be it at home, in the working place, in the streets, out shopping, whatever activity. 24-7, they have peace. They are in peace. Even if on the outside there is a war. It's a war. Against evil. But within them there is peace. 
And when this person finds peace, then it's done. He becomes happy. The Apostle Paul teaches. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul teaches. Therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith, meaning the supernatural faith, the intelligent faith, justifies us before God. And the intelligent faith is that faith where one puts his life on the altar and lives on the altar, meaning their lives are constant and permanent offerings in the altar of God. So there they are justified. They become worthy. Worthy. It's normal for people to say, oh, I don't deserve. Yes, we don't deserve anything from God. But when we appeal to the supernatural faith, the intelligent faith, the faith which is supported in the Word of God, because faith is assurance, you have assurance of the Word of God, is for you. Then you apply that Word in your life, you exercise that Word in your life. And this practice of intelligent faith, faith in the Word of God, makes us to have our conscience cleansed, clean, and purified. And see, the Apostle is writing this letter to the Church of Rome. Those Romans who had converted to the Lord Jesus, they left behind their idolatry, their paganism, and embraced, embraced faith in the Lord Jesus. So this faith gave them peace, because faith justifies us. Perhaps this language of justified, the word, the verb justified, it's difficult for some people to understand. Justify means you are forgiven. For example, the lawyer defends his client from any guilt. The client was caught by the police and brought to the judge. The judge will judge what he did. So the lawyer has the obligation to defend his client to try and justify him, to try and take out his blame, eliminate the blame. Excuse me, let me drink some water. Look, person committed a crime. Then, he is taken before a judge. But in which circumstance did he commit that crime? In which circumstance? This is what the lawyer will work on. He will work in the circumstances in which that person committed a crime. So if the crime was premeditated, then the lawyer who defends the client, he becomes, or rather he has no substance to defend him because he premeditated the sin, which is iniquity. Iniquity is this. A person premeditates the sin. He gives ears, he gives life to that idea which they project. This is iniquity, which is the worst, worse than sin. 
but the lawyer. He has no substance to defend his client. Because the accuser said, no, he planned the death of this man. Look, it's planned, it's proven. Here are the proofs. So, this proof which is strong enough to not be debated, so the client of that lawyer will see that he deserves to be condemned. But if the crime was committed in an act of anger, wrath, all of a sudden they smashed his car on the road and the other shot the other, there was a fight and one killed the other. So the judgment of the client, of the criminal, though it may have been a crime, the judgment has another parameter, another line of action to defend him. So the lawyer will say, look, judge, what happens is the following. You know that in an act of anger, wrath, they do what they shouldn't do. They are enraged, their emotions are very strong, and they take a decision. And he will try to defend his client using that argument. It was in self-defense. Self-defense. Then the judge will consider the proof which is in favor and against the client of the lawyer and will judge. Now, it's very interesting for you to understand this part. Same thing as the other person who killed his wife or killed the husband. Why did she kill the husband? What was the reason she killed him? So the judge will judge according to the circumstances which happened to that crime. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, when the Bible says that we are justified by faith, it's clear because the crime, which is the sin, has no grounds. Why did he commit that sin? No, there's none of that. He committed a sin. The sin, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And all those who sin, all those who sin, all those who live in sin will die. And not simply dies, everyone else dies. Everybody dies, just and unjust. But those who live in sin will die in sin and will live for all eternity in eternal condemnation. So when we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is when we obey His Word, His voice, practicing His Word, then automatically we are justified. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus paid for these sins in Calvary. This faith is what makes us to be just, righteous before God. No one is simply righteous or just because they do charity or they're good or because they harm no one. No. The divine justice, better saying, those who are justified, the justice which God justifies is for those who really have their faith applied, practiced in the word Jesus Christ. So Paul mentions here in Paul chapter 5, and I like these scriptures, especially here in Romans 5, because, for example, I will speak of myself. When I met Jesus, I would not think that I was a sinner. He died for my sin, but what sin did I commit? I don't kill, I don't steal, I wasn't stealing, I wasn't killing. Lies, yes, I would lie, of course. 
unbelieving as I was, deceitful as I was, I would deceive. But I wouldn't consider that. I would think that sin was only to kill, to steal, to commit adultery, etc. Things of this nature. As many people think, they think that sins are only those, you know, grotesque sins. No. I thought I had no sin. So I accepted Jesus, but I would not change my life. My conscience would always accuse me in a way that I was afraid of dying and going to hell. Meaning when our conscience is not clean or cleansed by the blood of Jesus, then it accuses us of our sins. But I did not think I had any sins, but my conscience proved that I had sins because it did not let me live in peace. If I died at that time, I would have gone to hell. So I want you to understand well what the word justified means. When the apostle says, justified by faith, meaning we have no merit, I was not deserving to be justified or forgiven, but because I accepted Jesus, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I believe that He died for me, for my sins. I thought of myself. Lord, I recognize my sin. And it was the Holy Spirit and is the Holy Spirit who convinces us of sin. He who convinces us. And he convicted me out of my sins. When I saw my sin, my God. It was a shocker. It was shocking because I became desperate. I saw my sin. I saw, I saw my sin. It was terrible. It was cruel. God gave me eyes to see myself as He saw my sins, how He saw them. And desperate, I would say, who can save me? Then the Holy Spirit led me to the Lord Jesus, who was ready to save me. And he saved me. From then, I lost that fear of dying, that fear of the devil. I lost that fear of hell. I lost it completely because my conscience was cleansed, clean, pure. And this pure and clean conscience would give me peace, permanent and constant peace. And I would like you to have this peace. Excuse me. I would like you so much to have this peace that you may evaluate the Word of God. So, justified by faith. Justified by faith. I am not justified by the grace of God. No. I am justified by faith in the Lord Jesus. I had to do my part. God gives us the grace to forgive us, to accept us, to convict us of our sins. But it depends on each of us to decide if we accept the sacrifice of Jesus for us, if we believe in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us, and because of this, because of this belief, then we start to practice His Word, obey His voice, then 
uma conexão a um casamento. There is a connection, marriage between us, meaning a covenant between us. Deus fez a parte dele. God did his part. Eu fiz a minha parte. And I did my part. Então eu vivo em paz. So I live in peace. I have peace. Ainda que do lado de fora. Even if on the outside there is always war. Então, so, você verifica que you verify é that this faith which the Apostle Paul mentions, which brings to us peace, if it is not within you, you will not have peace. And I speak of peace in your conscience. The judge can unjustly judge the criminal and condemn him. But if this person was born of the Holy Spirit, having his faith firmed in the Lord Jesus, he is at peace because he knows that even if man have been unjust with him, even if the judge was unjust with him, but the just judge, the eternal judge, the true judge, who judges for all eternity, this judge, this judge absolved me. So it doesn't matter the persecution, the injustices, the injustices, the defamations, the hatred. It doesn't matter. If our conscience is at peace with God, then we are in faith and this faith gives us peace automatically. I want to tell you something. I counseled once an element, I say element because he, he did something extremely sinful. He did something aggressive to the church, something extremely aggressive to me who trusted in him, I trusted in him. He did something extremely aggressive to himself, to his family, to his wife. And he came to me and said, Bishop, I was wrong because he was caught. His wife caught him in the moment. And he said, Bishop, I'm wrong. I committed sins. Then I asked him, so and so, are you confessing everything? Is it everything you did? Confess. Tell me everything. Because if you leave behind a little bit of sin hidden without confessing, my friend, your conscience would not leave you in peace. You won't have peace. And he said, no, I'm confessing everything. However, after he confessed a part of his deep sins, he remained tense, always nervous, a downcast appearance. He was in unrest. His eyes showed a deep sadness because he lost his peace. Even confessing a part of his sins. So it's like this. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. But the confession cannot be halfway, neither 90%. It's 100. So when there is sin, while there is sin, there will be no peace. There will be no peace. Listen to what I'm telling you. For example, I'm speaking to you right now. 
And you can feel the peace which I have because it's peace. I share it to everyone, regardless if they believe or not, but I share it unto you what I have. I give what I have. So many people in these moments can feel alleviated, a sensation of well being. But when the live video finishes and the person continues in sin, they go back once more to suffer. They return to suffer, to be accused. That guilt is hammering in their heads. Their conscience is hurting, crying and crying and crying. So a person has no peace. A husband, when he betrays his wife and sleeps with her that night, etc. And he said nothing to her. So he feels blamed. He feels blamed. Every time she sees her, him, she feels blamed. Guilt is a constant state. Why? Because they were not forgiven. And when we confess, profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we confess our sins, we live in holy harmony with God, with a clean conscience. We have nothing which accuses us. I have nothing which accuses us. Absolutely nothing. The devil cannot prevail over me because he has nothing to accuse of me because my sins were and are and will always be cleansed in the blood of the Lord Jesus as long as I present a solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the solid faith which practices and obeys the word of God is what justifies us before God. It justifies us. And if we are justified before God, if God justifies us, who will dare to accuse us? Do you understand, my friend? We will speak more about this. But I would like in this week to share with you here Romans chapter 5 from verse 1. But we are going to read, meditate, etc. Extract what we can because here it speaks of faith which gives us peace but also the faith which brings tribulations. We will speak more about this during this week. God bless you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. A man of deceit, a cheat, and a man of many disguises, outlawed with a price on his head by his own brother who promised to kill him. Despite his many mistakes, God considered him for his tenacity to conquer the blessing that his brother despised. That was Jacob. Time went by and Jacob became a very wealthy man. Accounted to him were many children, servants and possessions. But he was still Jacob the same person full of fears and conflicts. The vow made with God at Bethel ensured his success and gain and was responsible for everything he owned. But Jacob knew that all the wealth would not stop his brother Esau or the threat he had hanging over him. What was most important was missing. 
When receiving God's order to return to his father's house, Jacob sent everyone ahead of him, and he remained alone in the ford of Jabbok, a place cut off by a shallow river. Jacob anguished at the possibility of his death, humbled himself in the presence of God. He was sincere and transparent because he was tired of being who he was. It was at this time that the angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob in that place, and Jacob saw an opportunity of being transformed and grabbed it with all his strength and in faith, believing that he could change his identity. He wrestled all night long to lay hold of what he needed most. He inwardly felt his sacrifice. And there in the valley of the Jabbok, he left what he had carried all his life, the pretense and the deception. He no longer needed to hide who he was. What is your name? I am Jacob. At that moment, Jacob was peeling off his old self to put on a new identity given by God. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Dawn came, and he was now a new man. There were no more fears, uncertainty, or delusions because he had a personal encounter with God. Boldly, he went to meet Esau, who received him in peace. For Jacob was no longer there, but Israel. Like Jacob, many are weary of the life they live and the past they carry with them and want to get rid of the identity of lies and failure and are willing to fight to have the only one who can transform them from the inside out give them a new name, the Holy Spirit. The Ford of Jabbok, the place of the wrestling with God. My childhood was really difficult. We were 12 siblings, my dad drank a lot, and there was a lot of destruction within the family. It was all misery. We were in need, we were always hungry, and the only way out I saw was to go on the streets. I started using drugs, drinking, I was using cocaine, marijuana, all types of drugs that you can imagine. Then I started trafficking as well, I was stealing, and on a given day I ended up in prison. I stayed around 15 years there, and it was a life of suffering because I stayed in a prison where, you know, the rooms were really tiny, two, 22 people in there, all, you know, sleeping one beside the other. The only way we could get sunshine was on the legs, putting our legs outside the window. That's all. It was a complete suffering. Then on a given day, um, the Universal Church was already doing the work there in the prison. Pastors, assistants would come, and every time they came, the officer would say, Look, the Universal Church is here, who's coming? And I decided to go one day. I didn't know it. And I went down, and you know, in that place, it was so small, and we couldn't even see those who were there. We could only see like shadows. We could only hear what they were saying, but I went down determined that I would have a life transformation and the pastor was preaching down there that God heals, that God delivers and I could hear him, but I couldn't see the pastor's face, but those words I was receiving it for myself. 
When I went back to my cell to put my legs to take some sunshine, I asked God what He wanted me to do to change my life. And God answered me that I just have to follow Him. And that's when I surrendered my life there in prison. I gave my heart and that I decided to do His will to stop the life of traffic, to stop the life of drugs, you know, drinking, prostitution, even inside of the prison with drugs, you know, evil thoughts, all those wrong actions. I stopped everything inside the prison. Then the next step was to get baptized. I got baptized in prison in, uh, in, in, the, in cell number 23. And a new person was born there. The old Jair died and a new one was born. The only help we received there in prison, it wasn't even from family members, because family members would go there and they would leave without being able to provide anything. The most important to us was the universal church there that brought a newspaper, that brought a word, a book, that gave us a word of faith, a, a word of love, of care, you know. Then, on, on a given day, it was around 2 o'clock in the morning, I still remember, I was living there in a favela. There was a favela and a place there nearby that had more condition, and in the favela we were more rejected. But I was feeling honored because I knew God was with me. And I remember that 2 o'clock in the morning, I was seeking God, and I received the Holy Spirit there in the cell. I received a new creature. The old creature was gone of the creature of the traffic, to drug trafficking, suicide, uh, desire to steal. The only desire I now had was to help people. I was well. I didn't even want to leave prison anymore. I would stay there. But, you know, God's plan is different for us. After that, I made a vow with God of the campaign of Israel inside the prison. I was listening to the radio. I heard a bishop talking. Even if you who are in prison, you can also participate. So, And then my family came against me. Are you getting crazy? You're going to take the little money you have there and you're going to give it in the campaign. You don't even know what you're going to do. I have a sister who's from the church. And I told her the following. Look, take these 800 reais and take it to the lawyer and tell him, tell him to take me out of here. I told her I would give it to her so she could take it to the lawyer. But I believe that if I put this amount in the altar, God is going to take me from here and the doors will be open and I'll be a new person outside so bring me an envelope even though it was not allowed but I told the officer officer here there's an envelope I you cannot no it's here I'm going to put this money and you can give it to my sister and to bring it to church because this is my vow with God and then you know I was doing some some things there in the prison you know to give to get benefits only everybody that was there was respecting me. I, I was treated like I wasn't even a prisoner. And after I, I did my vow with my 800 reais, and now I told God, God, now I'm ready. Now it's you. After 15 days, I was there in the cell, and I heard my name. I heard my name. Jair dos Santos, I, was, I heard it. And I came. Even the director said, look, you shouldn't leave here, man, because it's a pleasure to have you here inside. And I said, I'm going to come back here to preach the word of God. And he said, when you come here, the doors will be open and you're going to take a coffee with us. And I was going, walking with God. You know, I was working here, working there. I worked for a couple of months and I managed to buy my new motorbike. And step by step, I even gave my testimony and I met my wife. I went to church on a Sunday morning and the pastor said, I will call a testimony here now, Officer Dijay. He's an ex-prisoner and he started to talk his testimony and it's unbelievable. When I looked to the altar and I saw him, it was like something told in my heart, he's going to be your husband. And I gave a comment to a friend of mine. And my friend laughed. Are you not afraid to marry an ex-prisoner? My dear, I'm not afraid, I said. No, I'm not afraid. You know why I'm not afraid? Because he's a man of God. I saw the sincerity in him. That's how I met him. And after a while we were dating, we decided to get married. 
I was in battle with God, doing vows with God, and always, you know, in the campaign of Israel, campaign of Israel, I was sowing. I started my own business. I didn't even have a house to live in. Now I have two houses, an apartment at the beach. I have a house with swimming pool, which I'm just finishing to build. My daughter has cars that I bought for her. My wife has three cars and I have a brand new car. My father to me, it's a big example. I always say that when we want to marry, will be with a godly man and I want him to be just like my father. He's a very protective father. I feel really safe with him. Today I have cars, I have houses, houses with swimming pool, apartment at the beach, my daughter has cars, but you know, humility must always prevail. And the most important was receiving the presence of the Holy Spirit while I was there in the prison at two o'clock in the morning. There is no prize for this because all the things we achieve in this world is all borrowed. One day it will stay behind, but the Holy Spirit in us will never abandon us if we don't leave him. The UCKG Helpline Call Center is open 24 hours a day, every day of the week, all year round. If you need help due to a serious problem you may be going through, if you feel that you have nowhere to turn to and desperately need someone to lend a listening ear, then we can help you. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have done, your religion or race. Your call will be answered by someone who genuinely cares about you and have your best interests at heart. We also arrange home visits or the housebounds and hospital visits for anyone in great need of kindly human contact. Whether it is simply information you want or desperately need someone to talk to, we're here for you.